Turn to the book of Numbers chapter 13. And Woody, if you'll put the first slide on there for me, I got it. I got it. So we're learning new things about this. There were numbers on the slides there. I was excited to figure out how to do that with this new thing. Yeah. Uh, and just like a lot of things, you know, I was talking to someone after early service this morning. It's amazing how God teaches us stuff by accident at times even. I was looking to do something else. I was like, whoa, I can use it. So, anywho. Book of Numbers, chapter 13. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. And dear God, I ask that you open it up to us, O God, and you teach us what's found within, that we might apply it to our lives and bring glory to your name. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So as I mentioned last week, we had tension building within the community of Israel. Uh, Miriam and Aaron had opposed Moses. You know, they, there had been an issue there that God dealt very severely with. But this was all leading up to what I mentioned was likely probably one of the worst failures in Israel's history. They had rebelled a number of times, but this one uh, brings me extra pause because there were, there were short-term consequences for the others, but this one's going to have a consequence of 40 years. So it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the people of Israel. Then he's going to give us all the names. And if you struggle to pronounce these, that's okay, because so do I, as you will see. And these were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shemuas, the son of Zakur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, I, I, Egal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, that is, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gemali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vofsi. From the tribe of Gad, Gu Guel, the son of Machi. These were the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So these were the names of the spies, but there are a couple of important ones that I, I you know, as we looked over them. Caleb from the tribe of Judah, keep that name in mind, keep not only the name, but the tribe in mind, and then also Joshua, son of Nun, that we mention here. Who was Joshua? He's, he's been mentioned a few times already in our story, so anybody remember, what's the connection here? Joshua was Moses' assistant, okay? This, this is the guy who later down the line will actually take over from Moses, just to let you know. So just keep that name in mind. He was sent as one of the, the spies. So Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negeb and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. And whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So he said, Moses told them basically, you're going to go in, you're going to scout out the people who are there, you're going to scout out the land itself, you're going to find out the terrain, you know, because if they're going in there, they're going to have to go in there with force. So they're going to need to know a lot of stuff about the land they're going into. Uh, they want to know, hey, how's the fruit there, so to speak? Just get all this information about the land. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob near Lebo Hamath. They went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. And Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. So they did basically what they were supposed to do, what they had been called to do, and that place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. So they scouted out the land. They did what they were instructed to do, and notice there was a specific people that was mentioned there. Um, and so just to give you a little bit briefly, the descendants of Anak. They were known for their height. These were a very large people. They were giants, so to speak. 
All right, so they scout out the land. And at the end of 40 days, man, 40 days, always a period of 40 days, isn't it? They returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they start out by showing the fruit. They gathered this cluster of grapes. They brought some pomegranates and figs. And what does that tell you? The land was good. All right. They told them, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So that idea of flowing with milk and honey, you know, it wasn't that it was just milk and honey, but that shows the richness of the land. That's symbolic language to show just how fruitful the land was. However, said, oh, the land is amazing. There's so much good stuff there. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. So the land was amazing, but the people were scary. But Caleb quieted the people. What tribe is Caleb from? Anybody remember? Judah. Judah. All right, that's going to be important. Keep in mind, Caleb from the tribe of Judah quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. What's important about the tribe of Judah? Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Who else? David. David. It's pretty much the whole kingly line will come from the tribe of Judah. So already we're seeing leadership from the tribe of Judah, all right? Way back before there's even a kingdom, Caleb says, hey, we can do this. We can take the land. Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. So this beautiful land that's flowing with milk and honey, it's a land that devours its inhabitants, they're saying now. And there there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Now let's clarify something there. They claimed that these descendants of, that these descendants of Anak are the descendants of the Nephilim. Who were the Nephilim? They were, they were these, you know, it's hard to clearly identify because we're talking very beginning of history here. But when we covered it in Genesis 6, that seems to be the natural fallout of when the sons of God, or the angels in that sense, went into the daughters of men and produced offspring. They were all wiped out in the flood, from my understanding. But to the Israelites, these sons of Anak, these giants, were like gods to them, so to speak. They were that terrifying. He said, we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. They bring back a report that says there is no way we can go in and take the land. Now, there's already a big gaping problem with with their story here. What's the big gaping problem? It keeps coming up throughout all these stories. Someone tell me. What's wrong? Yeah! Yeah! We're not able to. Of course you're not. They are way bigger than you guys. We're not strong enough. Of course you're not. If it were about you, then that would be a problem. Today we're going to talk about fear. Because fear can make you believe some things that simply are not true. Fear can make you do some things that you ought not to do. The Israelites were overcome by fear. Fear is one of the greatest obstacles you will ever face in your life. Let's talk about, first of all, the fear of inadequacy. That's what they were going through. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. The Israelites were facing that with a strength in mind, but we face that every day, too, in our lives, right? You ever think that? I'm not good enough. 
Oh, I can't, I can't really serve God. I'm not good enough to serve God. Oh, I can't go out and I can't go out and share my faith with someone. I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. Hey, oh, I I can't do this or that. I'm not strong enough. I face that. I know you guys have faced that. Everybody's faced that fear at some point. Fear of inadequacy. Which you can respond wrongly to that fear, because this is what I used to do as a teenager. <laughs> I'm amazing. I am good enough. No, it's not about me is what we have to understand. If God calls you to do something, it's not about you. It's always about him. He's going to provide the power for it. It's about the fear of not fitting in. What will people say about me? What will they think? I dealt with that one a lot in school. I don't know about you guys when you were in school. Oh, I, I don't want to act different. Ugh. People mistreat people who are different. I want to fit in. I want to be like everyone else. The Israelites were very different. They were not like everyone else. They're, when we get to their military tactics they're going to use later on, they did some goofy things. Tell me marching around a city seven times is, is a good military tactic? No, that's crazy, right? Tell me dwindling down your troops so that there are only 300 to fight? They're going to do some things that don't make sense to the world. Fear of not fitting in can hold you back. Fear of failure. Because what would failure have meant if they go to take the promised land and they fail? Oh, they would have been wiped out as a people. They would have been a laughing stock and a joke. What about, here's one that's common to us now, fear of disease. There's been a plague in our land. COVID-19. Now we're going to talk about the difference between caution and fear because it's wise to show caution. But you cannot let fear paralyze you and control your life. I have a few stories about lions to share with you. The first one comes from the book of Proverbs. And I have a fear that this isn't wanting to work. It was working. Thanks, Woody. Did you do that or did I? You got it? Thank you. All right. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 13, it says this. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. So the lazy person says, oh, I, I can't go out there and actually do anything. I'm afraid I might get hurt. Okay? The sluggard often speaks to me. This has been, honestly, my greatest hang-up in life is my own laziness. I didn't want to get it. I have a lot of excuse. If anybody ever wants to ask me to do something that I don't want to do, you will find that I am very, very good at making excuses. Incredibly good at making excuses. Oh, you want to go for a hike? No, there could be snakes out there. No, I'll get really sweaty and I don't want to do that. Josiah can ask me to play basketball and I can find a lot of excuses, right, Josiah? I found a lot of excuses already not to play basketball at times. I'm very good at that. There's a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. Now, could there actually be a lion outside at times? Absolutely. But can, should you use that to stop from doing everything, always? Hey, you shouldn't ever get in a car because you can get in a wreck, right? You can't be paralyzed by fear. Here's another lion story. What if you'll go to the next one for me? Okay, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, there's, there's a lot in this verse here, so let's unpack it a little bit. First of all, the devil is compared to a lion here. And it says that he prowls around outside of the camp. He... he prowls around like a roaring lion, all right? Now, if a lion were to be hunting or stalking around a camp and it were to roar, it would do so for a reason. Why would a lion roar? To scare you. Okay, it could just hunt out there and it would probably, if it was actually hunting, want to be relatively quiet so that its prey wouldn't know where it was coming from. So it roars because the flock is usually together and it roars to get maybe one or two of them to just run away because it knows that if it were to run away, then it has a target. Satan wants to make you afraid because he wants to isolate you. He wants to get you by yourself because that's when he can really work on you. The enemy would have you close yourself off and isolate yourself and get away from everybody. And please don't get me wrong on this. This isn't meant to be a direct critique against what we're doing with COVID because we do need to show wisdom and I will talk about that. But we ought not to isolate ourselves. 
Even if you have to socially distance in person, you need to have other people in your life at times. And I'm sure you guys have seen that throughout this time of social distancing when you've had to be somewhat alone. No man is an island. We're not meant to walk through this world alone. Yet, the enemy wants to get us there. So he will roar around. He will prowl around. But why doesn't he just come into the camp? Why not? He's a lion, okay? If we're compared to sheep, and he's a lion in that sense, lions shouldn't have a problem even with a large number of sheep. But the fact of the matter is, there's something that he's scared of that he doesn't want to come in to see. So if you go to the next slide, please, Woody. In the book of Revelation chapter 5, there's a story going on here. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, which is God, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Next slide, please. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Continue on. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Verse 4. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. But thanks be to God, verse 5 comes in. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The enemy has to prowl around because he cannot come into the camp because there is a lion in the camp who is more powerful than him that he does not want to mess with. Okay, we make the mistake at times you know, and, and honestly, this really happens in a lot of forms of Pentecostalism, in a lot of Pentecostal churches. We make the mistake of thinking that Jesus and Satan are somehow equals in power. That we really have to fight back against the devil, and it's, an, it's a fair fight. And I, saw, I saw someone's name online that uh, their name was something along the lines of, you know, like Satan's demon or something. Like they were proud of that. And... and and honestly, the thought that came into my head, other than being, you know, really offended is, man, you must really like playing for a losing side. Guys, it is not a fair fight. Jesus has already won the fight. Satan has absolutely no power. Okay? He is a defeated foe. Have you read the story of the book of Job? Satan has to go to God and ask for permission to even bring a temptation, to even bring a trial in your way. And therefore, if, you, if God allows him to do that, what does God think about you? You have power to get through it. Your, your trials are not meant to destroy you. Jesus told Peter as he was about to go to the cross, he says, you're going to deny me. But he also said, Satan is seeking to sift you like wheat. But I pray for you that when he restores you, that when God restores you, you will then help your brothers, okay? Satan is more powerful than you, but he's got nothing on the Holy Spirit that lives within you. Amen. The Israelites had nothing on the Canaanites that they were going to go fight against. They were small. They were less than them. And that's why God called them, because God wanted to show his power in the earth. Now, if you look around, and, and I mean, you don't have to look around too much right now, but we have people of all different walks of life in here. God does not call just the best and brightest. He does not call just the, the what's the opposite of best and brightest, the worst and lowest. He calls any and all of them to show that it's not about us. It's not about how good you are. He doesn't need your skills or your talents. Okay? It's not about how bad you are. All right? There is no qualifier or disqualifier as far as you go. It is not about you. It is all about God. We have a defeated foe that if we will learn to tap into the right power source, if we will learn to walk in God's power, we have no reason to fear anything. Because Jesus is not only the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is the good shepherd. He is there to help you. He is there to guide you. Move to the next slide, please. 
In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Notice that's in the past tense, have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We can have victory over... Because see, here's the thing. The Israelites didn't lose the battle to the Canaanites. The Israelites, in the book of Numbers where we just read, lost the battle to fear. They lost the battle before the battle. That's where Satan will try to get you, is in that battle before the battle. Because he knows he's not going to win the real battle, so he just tries to get you scared so you won't show up. That's what he wants to do. They said, we can't take the promised land. We're not strong enough. Of course you're not, but God is. We can have victory over fear because the power that we need doesn't come from us. Okay, if there's a bad storm outside, you can have the fear that your power is going to go out. And it very well could. Okay? Our power is not going to go out. They already tried to kill Jesus, right? What did that do for him? That just showed his power, didn't it? Because he had power over death, and then he ascended to the Father, and he's never going to die again. All right? His death was part of the plan. That showed his power. Our power source is untouchable. It's all available. We just have to learn to trust him and use it. So let's, let's look at the practical in our lives. I can't understand the Bible. It's too confusing. I've heard people say that. I've, I've, went, I've had that doubt in my mind at times. I can't understand this. I can't get this. Well, if it was up to you, maybe not. But good thing, God the Father sends his Holy Spirit to live in you if you're a believer. If you're saying, I can't understand this, you're saying, man, God's powerful, but he's not powerful enough to get it to me. Come on. Of course he's powerful enough. You can understand. Doesn't mean it won't take work. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. I can't share my faith. I don't know enough to share my faith. Does God need your wisdom? Does God need your intelligence? No, what does God actually need? What does he want? Yeah, and he wants your willingness. If you're willing, God will do amazing things with a willing heart. Okay, I've told you guys, which, which uh, you can think what you'd like of me as a preacher. I mean, I, I'd say sometimes I, I leave, it's interesting, sometimes I leave here and I walk out and I feel like, oh man, I just messed all that up and it was terrible. And, and then those days are usually the ones that my wife comes up to me and says, that was one of your best sermons, Cody. <laughs> and then I'll have days and I'm like, hey, that was good. That was going well. And then, well, I mean, no one's life really changed, so, you know. But I can tell you, my first sermon, I remember it well. I stammered and shook and I had no idea what was going on and I got lost in my notes and couldn't find it, so I just rambled I rambled for about five minutes while I tried to find my place and then just sort of had to give up. And it, it was rough in a lot of ways. But God didn't just say, okay, sorry, you're disqualified. No. He invested in me. And as I learned, because see, used to, I'd write down every single word I wanted to say. That's, that's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because that makes it about me and my preparation. No, I prepare, I have an outline, but I have to trust, okay, God, this is yours. This is your time. All right, I'm going to be prepared because you've given me, you know, time to prepare, to be diligent with it. But then when I'm up here, it's all, you know, whatever you want to do with it, God, you're in control. And he provides. It's amazing how he does that. All he needed was my willingness. And he fills in the rest. Don't think that you can't do anything that God would desire for you to do. So if there's something in the Bible saying, hey, do this, you can do it as God enables you. But it's all about his strength. Here's one that's common in our society. This one is a critique on, on our current society. This one says, we have to keep all the businesses closed. We have to stay inside our homes. We can't go to church because if we get out, we might catch the virus. There's a lion outside trying to eat us. So understand, we have to see both sides of this because there, there are at least two sides to this. First of all, it is wise to show caution, and we're going to talk about the wisdom in that. But by the same token, you cannot be governed by fear. Fear is the catalyst in our world that is leading to increasing and increasing hatred. Right? 
Okay, so we have, we have a protest going on in our society, which I haven't talked about much because honestly, I don't feel like I have a lot to add to the conversation. Um, and, and I'm learning to use my ears first. All right. But I can tell you those protests are going on because there is a perception that a certain group of people by their race are afraid of the cops because of police officers who have abused their power. Okay. And I can tell you that all racism is fear. Why would you be afraid of someone because they look different than you? Why would you think differently of someone because they look different? It's craziness. That is all based upon fear. All of it is fear. All the hatred in our society. You know, you can't walk within six feet of someone in a store now. Why not? Well, it's because of fear. We don't want to pass on the virus. We don't want to contract this. Once again, you have to be respectful. You can be cautious. That's good. But don't be afraid. And here is why you need not to be afraid as a believer in Jesus Christ. There is a reality that you could catch the coronavirus. That is a reality, right? I mean, apparently this thing spreads like wildfire. Okay, now let's, let's go. We, understand, we're not given special immunity to these things because we're Christians. I used to think that way. I used to think, hey, because, because I'm blessed, I'm not going to get this or that. Guys, there's no promise that we're not going to get this disease. You could get it. In fact, and God forbid that this happens, but you could even potentially die of that. So it's wise to show caution. But what I want you to understand is that you don't need to be afraid because even if we were to die, even if we were to die, go on to the next slide, please. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You are death proof in that way. You have power over death that even if the worst thing in the world were to happen to you, you'd be okay. Now, it's, it's hard to think that way, but, but honestly, you know, I've, I've preached too many funerals in the past year. I don't like preaching funerals. But I've learned that, that there comes a point in someone's life where the people, that there are more people that they love who are over there than people who are left here. And they still love the people there, but boy, they're looking forward to seeing the people who are over there. All right? To die is game because guess what? There's someone else that you love that you've never met face to face who's waiting there. And his name is Jesus. I am really looking forward to meeting him face to face because I've been following after him for so long now and I've seen his love and I've, I've, I've got to know him so well, but I've never met him face to face and I want to do that. To live is Christ because there's fruitful labor here, but to die is gain. So even if we were to get something as bad as that coronavirus and it were to go into its worst possible outcome, it's still gain for us as believers. So you don't need to be afraid. But let's look at the flip side because don't, don't, uh, don't misquote me here. Show respect in these things, in each of these examples. First of all, show caution in getting out. Not fear, but caution. Be aware of uh, other people's boundaries. Don't take unnecessary risks. Now, there's another lion story. I didn't include it in the PowerPoint. But men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were in Babylon... The king said, hey, you're going to bow down to this statue and you're going to worship it or else you're going to be thrown into a den of lions. Now, these three men, they didn't just go vacationing to the lion's den every weekend. They didn't go hang out around the lions because that would be foolish of them. They probably would have been eaten if they were just, you know, goofing around playing with the lions. But they were not afraid of the death that could be caused by the lions. Do you know they didn't know they were going to be saved there? Or sorry, it's Daniel in there. They went in the fiery furnace. I'm sorry. Okay? Do you know that, but, but in the fiery furnace, we'll talk about Daniel and the lions too. Do you know they didn't know they were going to be saved? They didn't. They said, God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to you. And they said, do what you want. Daniel, likewise, he was told to only pray to, you know, the king for 30 days. And he said, sorry. He went and he prayed to God. And, you know, they threw him in the lion's den, but... Once again, they weren't hanging out in the fiery furnace. Daniel wasn't hanging out in the lion's den normally. But they trusted God, so they weren't afraid of those given situations if they would come up. And God protected them. Okay? Show respect. Don't live in an uh, irreverent way in that regard. But don't be paralyzed either. If you've been given 
an opportunity to share your faith, give diligence to it. You know, Shane's going to be preaching here, and I know, I, I trust already, that Shane has been doing work in preparation. Because I can tell you, because I've taken the, you know, I said, I, I prepared out word for word. Well, then, you know, because, so, you guys ever play ping pong? The ball goes from one side and back to the other. Okay. I went from, okay, well, hey, this has all got to be God, so I'm just not going to prepare at all. How well do you think that one goes? Doesn't go well either, all right? It's much more towards the middle. You need to prepare and you need to trust God. And what you'll find is if you don't have time to prepare, God will still provide. And if you do have time to prepare and you just waste it and don't use it, then watch, God still provide, but he's going to teach you something about it too, all right? It was somewhere in the middle. Show diligence to your work. Be prepared to share your faith. Well, if you don't know a lot about the Bible, how can you share your faith? You can. This isn't a, a defeatist question here. How do you share your faith if you don't know much about the Bible? Your life. Yeah, your life. You have something called a testimony. Every single one of us has a testimony. That's what the Samaritan woman used when Jesus, you know, she said, he told me everything about my life. He told me everything I've ever done. And people believe because of that. Okay? If you will just simply tell them what God has done for you or what God has done in you, that's powerful. That changes people's lives. You can share your faith. You don't have to be, you know, very well educated or well rehearsed or have good public speaking ability. You can do it because it's not about your power. But you still show diligence to getting it ready. You show diligence to say, hey, how am I going to go about this? You're struggling to understand the Bible? Don't get afraid and just put it down and say, ah, well, I'm just going to avoid that. No, ask for help. Just don't put it down and just give up. Give diligence to it. So you see, don't be controlled by fear, but at the same time, don't be lazy. Don't be irreverent. Don't be foolish. Be wise. Be sober-minded in your activities. But don't be paralyzed by fear because the source of your power is unstoppable. God will provide for every single one of your needs, for whatever it is he calls you to do. God does not call a person to a task that he does not give them the power to fulfill. You might feel inadequate many times. And if it were left to you, you perhaps would be. I would be an absolutely terrible pastor if God was not with me. And you might still think I'm a terrible pastor. I don't know. But, but I can tell you through God, I'm not afraid to be your pastor. If it was just all up to me and I had to figure everything out, oh, buddy, we'd be in trouble. But if I can learn to trust in him and lead you guys that way, I can do what he's called me to do. Okay? Shane's going to do an amazing job next week. I'm not going to oversell you here, Shane. But he's going to do an amazing job next week. And how do I know that? Well, I have a lot of confidence in Shane. I believe in him. But more than that, I believe in God. Okay? And he's going to hear this and say, okay, that's going to be a reminder for him because God uses these sermons to teach all sorts of people all sorts of different things. And he's going to come up here next week and he's just going to knock it out of the park. I can't wait to watch it online. It's going to be great. All right? Do you get where I'm coming from? The Israelites did not go into the promised land because they were too afraid to even try. Many people today, as C.S. Lewis says, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and rarely tried. Don't be governed by fear. Don't be held back by fear. God is greater than any obstacle you can face. But you have to realize it's not about you. You're not the one conquering the obstacle. God is conquering it through you. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you free us of fear, O God. Let us be wise in our actions, but let us not be fearful in our actions, O God. Free us from that obstacle, for Lord, that is obviously one of the greatest obstacles any of us faces today. Help us when we become afraid, because fear is a natural emotion that you've given us. Help us to do what it's intended to do. Help it to draw us to our Father. Help it to draw us to you. Teach us to come near to you when we're afraid. And then to walk in your power for whatever it is you would have us to do. Ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.